Now, what are these um, five or four stages of canonization that uh, I'm talking about? So I will give you here a, a very rough um, uh, outline of the process from the beginning uh, until the 20s. Um, so we, uh, 632, okay, 11 Hijri, 632, uh, the prophet dies. And um, as I always say, this is one of the mysteries that we try to um, answer. Some people came up with good answers, other people didn't. We are still speculating. Uh, we know that you know, the prophet, uh, his basically prophetic career spanned over 21 to 23 years, right? And the revelation was always uh, coming to him until you know, he died. One of the questions that we ask ourselves, why didn't, and the prophet did not die suddenly. He knew when he was dying, he predicted it, you know, he performed the last pilgrimage, and he did not collect the text, okay? He didn't. We have some accounts, they are weak really accounts, weak in terms of, uh, from even the Islamic tradition, that he probably had a prototype of the Quran. He told some people to write down some verses, to you know, change the order, but we really don't any have solid accounts of the Prophet collecting the Quran and coming up with a text, okay? So that's, let's say, a fact that we don't have, even if he did, of course, we don't have this collection. So the Prophet dies and the text was not collected together. Um, so we have first, you know, the first caliph and then the second caliph, they were busy with the, with the wars and, you know, establishing this, the new Islamic government. And then the third caliph, Uthman, and this is what we call the major collection of the Quran, happened during his time, okay? And this is the year 47 Hijri, Islamic calendar around 656. So this is roughly 30 something years after the Prophet dies, okay? So now according to the major narrative, the Quran was collected you know, around 35 years after the Prophet died. Um, and this is what we call the first collection. So, so this is not canonization. Um, this is still a collection of the Quran. The Quran was uh, spread, it was written on, on different forms, on different parchments, on bones, on leaves. And then um, I will show you now the two stories of the major collections and I will quickly summarize them. Summarize them. Uh, Uthman collects them, not himself, a committee did that. And this is what we call today the Uthmanic uh, codex, right? So if you open the Quran and you read Al-Mus'haf al-Uthmani, which means that this is the collection of Uthman because there were other codices by other companions that we don't have access to. They were destroyed, they were burned, and the only survive, the codex which survived is the uh, codex of Uthman. And this is why it's called Al-Mus'haf al-Uthmani. So after that we have here between the year 656 to 936. This is almost 300 years, okay? Um, and the first 200 years, this is what we usually call like the formative period of Islam. We really don't know much about it from that period. We only have writings from later period, from later historical sources about what was happening. We don't have really writings from the first century and basically mid of the second century. Um, uh, Islamic calendar. And during that period, we do know that there were many reciters and many scholars reading and reciting the Quran in so many different ways, okay? Not even according to seven systems or ten systems. They were reciting the Quran and according to one compilation to 50 different systems and readings, okay? And this is, was, of course, too much. So you need, you are, you are establishing, you know, this is the new religion, you are establishing a new government, you need to stand, you need a constitution. And you can't just like have 50 different versions of one divine text. You need to limit these variants. So this man came, Ibn Mujahid, which is in the title, and he compiled a book uh, which is called The Seven Readings, as Sabah fil Qiraat. And he said, well, out of those 50 plus different systems of recitations, I'm going to limit myself to only seven. And his canonization, this is a canonization process where he uh, neglected the 43 different systems and he chose seven systems because of different criteria that we are still trying to figure out. Um, but what helped him is that he was politically connected. So he actually was connected with the court and he forced people who did not follow his system to actually go to prison. So there were other reciters and other scholars who disagreed with him. And they said, no, why are you limiting yourself to those seven? And he said, well, this is my opinion. You have to follow me. He was connected with the wazir, Ibn Muqla, by the time. And then the wazir, anyone who disagreed with Ibn Mujahid's systems, they tried them, they put them in prison. And then if you don't follow Ibn Mujahid's system, um, you are not reciting the Quran properly. 
and they would either repent or they would follow Ibn Mujahid's system. And it became basically a standard since then that people would follow the system of the seven, what we call right now. That being said, of course, after Mujahid Ibn died in 324, scholars still disagreed with him. Why did Ibn Mujahid do this? Seven readings. We have so many wonderful readings out there, and this man is very trustworthy. Why did he neglect his reading? So scholars still transmitted and recited uh, Quranic readings and systems beside those seven systems. And with time, until basically, I will talk about this in a moment. So after here, so 833, so also 500 years later, this man comes, Ibn al-Jazri, and say, well, I'm not content with seven systems. I'm going to basically compile 10 systems. And this is what we, are, what we call the system of the 10 readings. Seven of those systems are the same systems of Ibn Mujahid, but he added three more. And he said, well, I do think that those three readings are also good, and they are standard, and we should include them in the system. And you know, right now, again, you can, we still have people who are reciting according to those three additional readings, and you can take a certificate also uh, with the sheikh or with the religious scholar, and they are considered all to be equal, Quranic, and valid, okay? Now, between these two periods right here, we have this very important period, and this is North Africa, Muslim Spain, right? And this is a Dani and the Shatabi, they were both from uh, Andalusia. And what they did is they, um, the system of the seven, what we have right now, yes, it's because of Ibn Mujahid, but if it were not for a Dani and the Shatabi, we actually wouldn't have the system of the seven because they were the ones who popularized the system. So a Shatabi, he wrote a very famous poem, okay, and he summarized all the different variants of those seven readings in the poem. And since that time, if you want to study the Quran, you have to memorize this poem in order to get your certificate. So even today, if you want to memorize the seven variants of the Quran, you memorize this poem, and what we call a shatabiyya. And this is the manual of the different readings. And uh, at Dani, what he did is that he, um, a shatabi, he wrote the poem based on a manual that Ad-Dani wrote. So Ad-Dani simplified the book of Ibn Mujahid. He said, well, this is too long, it's 800 pages, there are too many variants, it's too technical for the student, so let me simplify it for just the lay Muslim who just want to know what are the different variants. So Ad-Dani wrote this short manual, it's just like 90 pages, and it's almost like a, ta a table of the variants. So this verse, you read it this way, this word, it's read in three different ways. Ashati became and put it in you know, he versified this manual and it became so popular because people, even scholars, the material is very complicated and technical, even for Arabists and, you know, scholars of Islam. It's very deep in philology and grammar and people really, when they read Ibn Mujahid, they don't understand what's going on. And this is why these people popularized the tradition and it became accessible to people who are able to memorize the poem and know, oh, well, this reading is this, this reading is that because I memorized the poem. And as some of you know, poetry in everything in Arabic tradition functions based on poetry. It's like didactic poems. We have poems in, in prophetic traditions in medicine and logic. Everything is, you know, it's easy to memorize if you have a poem in front of you. And what also these people did is that uh, each of those systems, you would think that, oh, okay, fine, we have one system and it's one reading, but actually it is not. Each of those seven eponymous readers, they had different disciples, okay? And each disciple actually was reciting something different from his other classmate. So you would have, let's say, a professor who is the eponymous reader, and he had like, you know, 15 students. And then the 15 students will go and say different things. And they'll say, you know, the professor is saying that. But then those 15, they really didn't agree on everything. So they would have, let's say, a 20% you know, uh, differences in what they are saying. So what Danny and Ashatabi did is that, okay, we are not going to take what those 15 students narrated from the eponymous readers. I'm just going to take two. Okay, so two out of 15 or 20. And this is what we call the canonical uh, rawis, the transmitters, uh, developed during that period. Again, and it survived until today. So if today you want to uh, recite the Quran or memorize it or have a certificate in it, well, this is what we call Hafs an Asim. So Hafs is a transmitter and Asim is the eponymous reader. So if you want to do the Quran, you don't do Asim. There's no such thing as Asim. There's Hafs, 
عن عاصم so حفظ on the authority of عاصم the other reading is شعبة for example أبو بكر شعبة you say okay I want to memorize the Quran or transmit it or recite it based on the transmission of شعبة or أبو بكر from حفظ etc we have the Medina tradition for example ورش okay you say ورش عن نافع نافع is the eponymous the boss right and ورش is the disciple so there's no such thing as the reading of نافع there's a transmitter on behalf of his master but we do have different transmitters but those traditions died out and only those two transmitters survived and this is because of you know these two men right here right the fourth transition this is not actually a official it is an official of course canonization process but uh, i call it a fourth canonization because uh, what al-azhar did in 1923 and followed also by the first audio recording in 1964 of al-Husari of the Quran. The first audio recording was based on that specific reading which we are all familiar with now is Hafs an Asim, right? And what al-Azhar did in 1923, they printed the Quran and they voweled it based on that specific reading. And since that time, most Muslims and most Arabists, and you know, this is how, this, when you grow up in a Muslim country, you read the Quran based on that, unless you are in a very specific, you know, regions in the Arab world. For example, let's say in Libya, they would still follow the Basran tradition, okay? Uh, in Medina, still until they do both Hafs and Warsh at the same time. Also in North Africa, they do Warsh, which is a Medina also tradition. But most people are familiar with that specific uh, tradition, which is Hafs an Asim, which is different. I don't want to say very different from the other traditions, but it is different. Um, and what Al-Azhar did and what most people followed, you know, uh, this is because due to that first printed edition, which became available to everyone, everyone would buy the Quran and would have access to it, and it's based on the reading of Hafs an Asim, that specific reading out of seven systems, and if actually if you want to also divide it into seven, two from each one, that's, you have potentially 14 different systems. So if you uh, go to a specialized um, um, institute with that print uh, codices for you, you tell them, give me a codex uh, of the, based on the reading of, let's say, Warsh, and give me a codex based on the reading of the Basra. And then you will have on the first page or the second page written, this is the Al uh, Mus'haf al-Sharif, okay, the noble, you know, Quran, based on the reading of Hafs or based on the reading of Warsh. She would read that, you would have it basically written on the Mus'haf. Okay, uh, if for specialized institutes like you know, Majma uh, al-Malik Fahad, for example, in Saudi or in Egypt, they do that. Okay, but if you just go to a bookshop and you, buy, you get a Quran, you will most probably get just that edition which we are all familiar with. So that's roughly the layout of the four stages. Okay, of um, of the canonization. Now, in Islamic tradition. Um, now, of course, this we have. What are the problems now here? The problem is that um, in the Islamic tradition, the process of transmitting the Quran and receiving it um, is basically um, roughly. My graph is so bad, so forgive me for that. It's just like very simplistic, but the the idea is that the Prophet uh, received the revelation, okay, from um, not directly from God, right? Through basically Gabriel, right? So the Prophet never spoke with God directly. It's always through the mediation of Gabriel, who recited the Quran to him, and then the Prophet recited it to the Muslim community, to his, the, to his disciples, right, to the companions. And what, so this is here, you know, different transmissions, and basically, allegedly, the idea is that all of them received more or less the same transmission. And the Muslim community, which are the, dis the disciples of the Prophet back then, they also transmitted that Quran orally. We are talking about oral transmission here. There's no written transmission. So this is all memory. You memorize it, you, you, you recite it to the others, and people, uh, there was no ri writing system was very minimal back then. Um, the companions of the Prophet also transmitted it and recited it to their disciples, which we call the successors, okay, or tabi'un. And this, the same process happened, you know, over and over and over. And this is what in Islamic tradition we call tawatur. And tawatur means that the Quran was transmitted in such a way that it is impossible for diversions or differences to happen within the text. So it was transmitted, you know, it, it is, it's like something that is known for everyone. When you say, for example, you know, the sky is blue, 
this is something what we call in Arabic mutawatir. Everyone knows the sky is blue in the morning at least, right? Because the sky is blue. Like, can anyone tell me like the sky is green or I don't know, a purple? No, the sky is blue or the sea is blue or something like that. So, or um, I don't know, the sun will rise tomorrow. It's just like this is mutawatir. This is everyone knows that it's taken for granted. And the same happened with the transmission of the Quran. That's, you know, the Quran was transmitted to the whole community and it's known to everyone that it is transmitted through this mechanism that there's no such way people cannot just, you know, collude on error or fabricate things because it is known to the whole community. So that's that's the idea. Um, and uh, however, when of course we um, we're not now talking from our perspective, even from the perspective of medieval Muslim scholars, when they looked at the different codices of the Quran and what we call the different variants, they said, okay, well, wait a minute. So why do we have these variations in the text? Why do we have textual variations? Why did some of the companions of the Prophet uh, have different codices from the main codex, you know, of the of Uthman, okay, the third caliph? Um, why do we have dialectal variations? If the Quran is the word of God, does God or did God speak in dialects, for example? Okay, so did he go and recite to the Prophet one verse according to the dialect of the East and then next day he recited to him the dialect from the West? So Muslim scholars they were trying to you know, understand like, these variations, what are the sources of these variations? Are they divine? or people came up with these variations and they are all permitted or we have a license to read in these different variations. That being said, if we do have license to read in different forms, why some variations were accepted and other variations were rejected, right? And that's what scholars over the past, let's say 30, 1200 years since basically the canonization process, they were trying to understand why do we have these variations? Uh, can we come and recite again to variations which are considered to be not canonical or not standard? Uh, or is it only the standard variations that we can recite? Now, what are the implications of that? Yes, you can basically now, I can come and recite something which is not canonical, but that doesn't mean anything. The important thing is a liturgical space. So if you want to pray, you have to pray and recite the Quran according to those seven different systems. You can't pray and recite something outside those seven systems. So that's basically the crux of the matter here. It's a liturgical text and it's where you recite it and when you recite it. However, if we are sitting right now and then, you know, we are here and then I tell you, well, listen, this is, you know, in not a non-standard recitation that some guy from Egypt recited, that's okay. Muslim scholars recorded that and they wrote everything down and they were very keen on collecting all these what we call non-standard uh, readings and they were actually trying to come up with more readings. So they were not really hiding away from the fact that there are different readings of the Quran. The most important part was when do we use these readings? Are they for exegetical purposes? Do we understand some verses better if we refer to some other readings? Um, uh, so that's where the usages of those uh, readings were very important for Muslim scholars. But if we recite the Quran while during prayers or during pilgrimage or in a public recitation, we have to follow certain systems. And what we are trying to understand why certain systems were rejected and other systems were accepted. Um, so I'm going to go to this uh, afterwards, just like these are the two basically um, uh, two major narratives of the collection of the text. I put the Arabic next to the English, just like so that if you want to look at it. Um, and uh, even the narratives of the collection of the Quran during the first collection and the second collection, they do, uh, many scholars tackled them and they pointed out, I underlined, you know, in, uh, in the English part, the problematic uh, pieces, historical problematic issues um, in the accounts. And why do people, um, uh, try to challenge these accounts. Are they fabricated? Uh, were they later on, you know, written and people forgot the details? For example, one of the um, interesting parts here is that here, this, this part right here, which in English, you know, it says, for example, when the first collection of the Quran took place, um, the man who was responsible for, who was the head of the committee, uh, again, I mean, put this in parallel with the idea that the Quran was transmitted to everyone and everyone knew 
all the information or all the Quran and it was mutawatir as we say. But then in this account, and this account is the official narrative, this is from one of the um, canonical traditions of the, the Bukhari. Okay, so this is the uh, canonical um, account of the transmission of the Quran from the Muslim tradition. It says that um, there were two verses from the Quran that he did not find with anyone else and they were only with one specific companion. Okay, um, he see the locating the parchments and poems from the uh, memories of man who knew it by heart and then I found with Khuzayma, that's the name of the person, two verses of, from Surah At-Tawbah which I had not found with anyone else. Okay, again we have to ask ourselves, so why these two men had two verses from the Quran that no one else from the companions of the Prophet had? Okay, so what happened to the idea that the Quran actually was transmitted to everyone and everyone knew the Quran by heart? If we, we are again talking here from the Islamic perspective, we are not even going out. So we compare this account with the other accounts from the Islamic tradition, we find contradictions. And what we try to understand is why do we have these contradictions? And which narrative, is this narrative before the narrative that the Quran is transmitted you know, to everyone equally? Or it's way the other way around. Or it's a vicious circle and we really can't know which one came before the other. And. Um, the other also interesting part of this account is when they collected the Quran, so first the, the only copy was with Abu Bakr, the first caliph, and then the sec the, when he died, um, the copy stayed with Umar, the second caliph, but when Umar dies, or when he died, the copy did not go to the third caliph, it went to his daughter, right? And that's also very intriguing because we are talking here about a governmental a constitution which should stay, let's say, in, with the caliph. It goes from the first one, the second one, and it goes to the third one. But then when the second one died, it did not go to the third caliph. It went to his daughter. As if the whole matter you know, transitioned from you know, a, um, a governmental, if you want, uh, space into individual place. Where why, why the daughter of the caliph would possess this codex and would not pass it or give it to the third caliph, which should be the case. And then if you compare, of course, with the second account, which is what we call the official um, canonization of the text of the Quran during Uthman, Uthman sends a messenger to her and tell her, please give us the copy that you have, okay, and let us copy it down. And this is where the first copying or the first codification of the Quran took place. And then Hafsa, the, she, is, she was the wife also of the Prophet and the daughter of Omar, uh, she sent them the first sheets, they copied it, and they made multiple copies and then uh, he gave it back. Of course, we don't have these sheets of Hafsa or the first codex, they are lost, um, or maybe they never existed. And also those five different copies that from the time of Uthman, also we don't have access to them. You know, they either never existed or also they were lost. Um, and this is basically a justification of what we call the five different codices. So we have the main codex, which is from Kufa in Iraq and the second codex is from Basra, also from Iraq. Okay, they are different. They have, different, they have differences also in, in vocabulary, in syntax, etc., and particles. And you have a codex in Mecca, you have a codex in Medina, right? And you have a codex in Dimashq in Syria. So these are the five major codices. And uh, in Kufa, you have one codex, but there are three different readings on Kufa, and this is what makes seven in total. So three from Kufa, one from Syria, one from Mecca, one from Medina, and one from Basra, and these are seven, okay? So these two, or basically this account, is a justification of why we have um, different readings and different variations in the text. Now.